morning, everybody. I apologize if I break into a coughing fit. It wasn't good timing for sages. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. My involvement in this project started after the first time I went to one of the postgraduate courses, and I was so impacted by my own ignorance about the energy sources that we use every day, and that really prompted my getting involved with Pews because I thought it was so important. So a lot of the work in my slides has been done by members of the committee. I've included uh, research that was done by members of the committee and people sitting in this room. So uh, I just want to say I have no disclosures. And um, there we go. Thank you. Oh, use a mouse? OK. The clicker. I got it. I think I got it. Okay. So what I want to do right now is just take a lot of what you've seen in these other talks and summarize it for laparoscopy because that's what most of us do. That's why we're at this meeting. And there are there's so much instrumentation and so much material whenever we do a laparoscopic case and we don't usually think about it as a potential for injury, but it is. And, you know, we just saw some nice pictures from Tom about what some of the consequences are. This is a patient who had a robotic prostatectomy and two days later was taken back to the operating room with a cecal perforation and after four washouts became somebody who we would talk about in one of our hernia courses. So the implications of unintentional energy injury during laparoscopy, you know, the consequences for the patient are tremendous. And it doesn't even have to be in the abdominal cavity if a um, return or dispersive electrode uh, becomes dislodged. You know, you can still have injuries during laparoscopic surgery. So there's a number of injuries, you know, just looking at uh, some surveys that were done. 18% of surgeons surveyed by the American College said that they had experienced or knew of insulation injury. Um, Many of these, as we just saw, can be undetected at the time of injury. And the financial implications in terms of malpractice claims are substantial. And it can happen to anybody. Um, I think everybody remembers a couple years ago, a very prominent senator died as a result of an insulation failure injury. So this is what's up in my operating room. And um, I didn't put these up, these were there. But I just want to show this is part of our timeout process. So any case we do, open laparoscopic, we are supposed to do a fire risk assessment. And now sometimes what happens is it just leads to the pointing out of where in the room the fire extinguisher is. In my hospital, there are 29 ORs, and you move around all the time. And they make them white, so they blend into the wall, or a cart is parked in front of them. So at the beginning of the case, the whole team just confirms, yes, we know where the fire extinguisher is. But the piece that a lot of the staff forget is assessing what is the risk. Is it an open case? Is it a laparoscopic case? Are you using energy? Is the patient intubated? So I'd just like to make a plug for including the fire risk assessment as part of your timeout procedure. Okay, so these are some of the mechanisms of electrosurgical injury that we've talked about already, and we're going to discuss these in the context of laparoscopy. So direct coupling is one mechanism of injury. When the resident has the, and we'll blame the residents in the room, right? We always do. So when the resident has their foot on the pedal and they're burning and they kind of go like that and they hit the camera, okay? So maybe the camera's touching the bowel. That is a way of directly transferring the energy to another instrument and to the viscera. That's why we try to be so careful with targeting where tissue is and then engaging the instrument. We'll talk a little bit about capacitive coupling, which is a little bit of a complicated um, concept if you're not an electrical engineer or a physicist, neither of which I am, but I think I understand it. So what happens is you've got stored electrical charge. Let's say you have two, you've got a metal instrument and a plastic cannula and you are engaging your energy and an electromagnetic field around that current is building up charge which is being stored in the cannula that cannula then touches something else, you are dispersing that energy on an unintended target. So you get the energy um, flow being diverted. The higher the voltage, obviously, the higher potential uh, diverted energy and injury. Okay. 
So we talked about some of these things that can cause the problems. I want to point out on the bottom here, we went through um, a while back at this August uh, meeting, a lot of talks about single incis incision surgery. So when you have multiple instruments together in very close proximity and you engage energy, you might actually be activating those other instruments as well. And so we're actually creating a more dangerous situation in terms of energy injuries when we do SILs. Also having um, mixed between our, our cannula, plastic, and metal. This is just to remember that you can have other sources of fire. So that light cord is really hot. Some of the cords these days turn off automatically when you detach them but you can set drapes on fire with your uh, laparoscopic light cords extremely easily. How many people have ever done that? Made at least a burn hole, a cigarette hole, right? Yeah, we've all done that. So we just have to be really careful with those products. Those fiber optic lights get really hot. Uh, also, um, Amin referred to the argon beam. Has anyone here used it laparoscopically? So what is the one thing you have to do when you turn that argon beam on? <laughs> so you need to open the vents, right? So it creates so much pressure. If you don't open the vent when you have the argon on, you could have a potential uh, pressure problem and explosion. So we also saw some nice slides about this. I just want to reinforce it. So insulation failure, okay? Small breaks in the tissue. We talked about the art, the art of surgery, which is that the smaller the surface area that you're conducting the energy through, the stronger the current, the more power being delivered to that spot. So you can see how yes. we're burning bowel there with an instrument which is not energized, it's just touching another one of the instruments, and that's from the break. So what do we do? We try to use monitoring systems to check our instruments, and. Um, there are different kinds available. Our sterile processing units are all supposed to be checking and, and using some kind of mechanism for looking at instruments every time. But I will tell you a quick story about my hospital. One day, my resident was happily taking the gallbladder off of the liver bed, and I said, hey, wait a minute, stop. Why are there burns on the liver over there where you're not working? And so we took a look, and we watched as he engaged the instrument we saw sparks coming out from about a centimeter away from the exposed tip. So we had an insulation failure. We said, okay, get this instrument out of here, quarantine it, give us another hook. And the same thing happened again. We had another insulation break at the tip. So as soon as that case was over, I grabbed my chief OR nurse and we marched downstairs to sterile processing and we looked for our instrument techs and said, where are our insulation devices, where are we checking? Are we really checking every one? And so they took us to the bench where they check, and they said, oh, well, the main machine is out for repair, and here's the backup. And they picked up the probe, which had been cut with scissors, so it was no longer attached to the machine. So no one had been doing insulation checks on our instruments. And that changed immediately. But if you start seeing things happen in your OR that shouldn't be happening, Go investigate, because our sterile processing folks work hard, but things can happen. So that was the liver where we were testing our insulation break and saw it significantly burning away from where it should have been. And Tom's group did this study where um, they looked at, they collected all the instrumentation from four hospitals, and they tested it. So they looked at L hooks that came out from a case. They looked at disposables fresh out of the package, and they looked at a bunch of reusable instrument sets, so whole trays. And look at that, 20% of the reusable instruments had, I think it was a 2.5 kilojoule dispersion of energy. Um, that's, that's a huge number, that's one in five. Uh, another interesting thing about this was that 18%, oh wait, it was 18% what, Tom? You guys found, give me a second here. Hmm, I'll remember a second. Okay, so you can also hurt yourself. Back in the old days of laparoscopy, before we had our uh, 
nice towers and HD. You can see Mike Brunt here is demonstrating what used to happen to the OBGYNs when they had a plastic ring around a metal scope. And you could actually, there were people got burned in the eye from looking through the scope that way. So you become the, uh, the target yourself. So this is another very interesting concept that Tom's group looked at, which is antenna coupling to common laparoscopic instruments. And so here by antenna, we mean that it is a device that is transmitting or receiving system that either radiates electro electromagnetic waves or receives the le electromagnetic waves. And the receiver is made out of metal or a conductive device, but it is not actively energized. It is just sitting there, it is neutral, but when in proximity to it, you create an electromagnetic field, you create an antenna, you can then couple the two and create charge in a cold instrument. So they did a very elegant study where an, acti an active electrode, which was never in contact with the tissues or the instruments, was activated next to other instruments. And they were held a constant distance away. And what they found was that with 30 watts, right? How many people here use 30-30 all the time? I do. When they held the telescope at a standard distance and activated for five seconds, the temperature, when they touched the tip of the scope to their uh, explant, went up by 38 degrees. And if you don't believe me, you can see the video. So, oh man, we implanted, we inserted it, darn it. Anyway, you can see the arc, and um, what's essentially happening is even though the active electrode is not touching the camera, it is next to the camera, the camera is picking up enough energy to cause arcing and actual dispersion of energy onto the porcine explant. So what are the practical considerations of this? To reduce antenna coupling, you can remove all of those metal objects from each other. So for example, unbundling your cords. We usually run all the cords together, right? Bovi is on the same tower as your, your, your power sources um, and your light cords. Separate them out. Maybe you can move one thing to one side of the table. Don't put them together. Um, also increase the distance between the tips of your active electrode and your other instrumentation. Some other ways that we can mitigate the risk. And again, Tom's group studied this. And I think he showed <coughs> that using coag significantly increases the amount of energy dispersed they showed that activating in open air, so that whole targeting, oh, I'm gonna step on it, but I'm gonna step on the pedal before I'm at my target, going back and forth. You know, sometimes a, a new resident or a new surgeon will, will do that. It significantly increases your capacitive coupling energy discharge. And then fulgration, where we're using that energy effect. So if you're using that effect, just beware that you've, you're dispersing more energy. And just desiccation with our cut is using much less power. They found that for capacitive coupling, all plastic or all metal trocars had the same risk. The diameter of the trocar didn't matter, but the increased activation time definitely led to increased energy discharge, which makes sense, and the same was true for the power setting. So less energy, less time, safer procedure. We talked about this a little bit. Um, how many people turn off the noise on their ESU, on the generator, or turn it way down. I've had a rash of, of, of nurses or somebody turning off the sound on the machine, and that sound is protected of you, especially if you teach or you have new people in the OR, and they're kind of, you know, especially this, the third year student who's just rotating on and doesn't know where to stand. Frequently, they will stand on that pedal and have no idea of what they're doing, and your only clue is the sound. So. I like to try to detach my cords as much as possible unless I'm actually using the energy and keep the sound up so that you have an audible alert if somebody is activating your device without realizing it. Also just beware that, you know, especially laparoscopically, 
thin tissue will carry current to places you don't anticipate. So again, limit the amount of time you're using the energy and just be careful of those thin uh, attachments. Use short bursts instead of a long one. And Tom just showed this how an ultrasonic instrument can get very hot. I think when you're doing laparoscopic surgery, you can sometimes forget. You know when it's open, you can feel the tip of the, harmo of the ultrasonic dissector, whichever one you use. You feel how hot it is. And I frequently make a resident grab it and touch it so they understand how hot it is right after they use it. But especially those first five to 10 seconds after activation. This was a study where they turned it on for five seconds, off for five seconds, and repeated that cycle four times, and then measured the energy or the heat when they touch tissue. And you can see we get close to that cell death. And I've had that same thing where a resident didn't quench the tip of the instrument on fat, inadvertently touched bowel, and then we have a 10 minute diversion while we're putting in an oversew stitch to make sure we don't have a leak two you know, days later. And unfortunately, this is what we see. This is a patient who a few days, about six days after a uh, I think it was a laparoscopic uterine suspension, was taken back to the OR for massive peritoneum and, and mediastinal air and had a several centimeter hole in the rectum from an inadvertent ultrasonic uh, injury and she wound up diverted and multiple washouts. So this is why we're here. We, we need to protect our patients from ourselves. Thank you. Thank you.